Hello, people. Welcome to the second session of our discussion. We were talking about uh, enlightenment ideas of childhood uh, and uh, various negotiations between European children's literature and Bengali children's literature during the 19th and 20th century. In my first lecture, for a quick recap, so to say, I talked about children's literature in Europe. I began with uh, the various philosophical theories of enlightenment. I talked about people like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and John Locke's theories of uh, the human mind being a tabula rasa or a blank slate. And I also talked about uh, John Locke's idea of empirical knowledge or true knowledge being constructed by sensory knowledge or sensory experiences. So, and then I went to how these ideas went on to fashion a new idea of childhood, the idea of the innocent child, how the theory of tabula rasa directly challenged uh, the idea of the original sin uh, inside the mind of an individual after being born and brought forward the idea of the innocent child. And it also laid an important emphasis on education because since John, John Locke was talking about the human knowledge consisting of sensory experiences, uh, mm -hmm. it thereby became apparent that it was actually important for someone to regulate those experiences which a child goes through uh, because it is those experiences which ultimately constitute the child's idea about the world. And who can regulate those experiences? It is the teacher, right? It is the educator. Uh, so education gradually became more and more important. Uh, there were new theories of education, uh, educating the child by love and patience without penalizing him according to medieval uh, beliefs, let's say, uh, and how uh, these new ideas of education are being talked about in texts like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, and then how the innocent child is being talked about uh, by William Wordsworth, by William Blake, uh, how it is also being put forward by people like Charles Dickens in the Victorian period. Uh, and then the kind of, uh, and then how the children's literature itself uh, gets born because of this, uh, let's say this educational tendencies, uh, because if you need to educate a child, uh, without penalizing him and all, you need to find unique and pleasurable ways of educating the child, right? So writing books for children uh, seemed one very good way of doing so. So you have the early instances of children's literature, which are written with strictly didactic purposes by people like, let's say, John Newbery and Hannah Moore and Sarah Moore, uh, and texts like Goody Two Shoes, which actually talk about educating the child, instructing the child. And then I also spoke about how uh, the idea of the child itself is getting changed uh, during the 19th century, during the Victorian period, during the later half of the Victorian period, let's say, uh, by people like Lewis Carroll, uh, in his uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, he shows how the innocent child of Dickens, let's say, uh, is gradually getting changed. The child is now asserting his or her own identity. Uh, people like uh, Lewis Carroll and then R.L. Stevenson uh, in his Treasure Island, uh, they are putting forward children protagonists who are protesting sometimes against uh, adult people who are uh, trying to control uh, their personality development and trying to fashion them according to the adult will. And they are trying to assert, the child is trying to assert uh, his own identity, his own personality. So uh, that is where I concluded in my first lecture. Uh, in this session, I'm going to talk about how these ideas of uh, childhood these new ideas, post-enlightenment ideas of childhood and uh, European children's literature, English children's literature, so to say, it gradually influenced uh, the Bengali people and uh, led to the rise of Bengali children's literature, so to say. Uh, so why am I taking Bengal as uh, 
uh, let's say, point of discussion here. Because as we all know, uh, the effects of colonization uh, for the first time became evident in Bengal. Uh, it is here that the British first got their taste of colonial power, let's say. Uh, and it is here that a class of English educated people termed Babus, uh, people whom Macaulay uh, said that uh, they will be black in their skin tone, but will be white in their thinking processes. So that kind of a class, the English educated Indian uh, people uh, came for the first time in Bengal, that recognizable social class. And it is they who first became influenced by uh, European ideas, let's say. Uh, and it is also they who became influenced, who were reading these people like John Locke, uh, like James Mill, like Jeremy Bentham in their educational institutions, uh, places like Hindu college, let's say. Uh, and they were getting acquainted with these ideas, the idea of tabula rasa, the idea of sensory knowledge, uh, empirical knowledge, let's say. Uh, and they were also getting acquainted with European works of children's literature, which were coming into being back then. So their thinking processes were also getting influenced by all this. They were also getting acquainted with this new idea of uh, the romantic idea of the innocent child. And they were also uh, feeling the need to educate the child in a modern way, in a European way, let's say, uh, to educate him uh, in a let's say more pleasurable manner uh, for example i mean uh, the traditional ways of education uh, in uh, bengal uh, places like the patshala the chotush Patki, it is called in uh, archaic bengali uh, if you follow the descriptions of these places they also followed some kind of a medieval uh, theory of education, right? A medieval theory of instruction. These places very much relied on physical violence, inflicting physical violence upon the child. Uh, you will find the Guru Moshai, he's always sitting with a bait and he is caning the truant child who does not listen to his instructions. I mean, uh, you have uh, such descriptions. You have Prashanu Guru Mahashoy in Pathet Pachali. You have uh, the Guru Mahashoy in the beginning chapter of uh, Sharachandra Chattopadhyay's Dev Das. Uh, they are all fierce figures, uh, figures who are penalizing, who use their cane more often than not. So these uh, ideas gradually start getting revised. Uh, people were thinking about more unique ways, more uh, patient ways of educating the child according to European principles. And uh, in doing so, they also felt the need for children's literature, which will be a very uh, good way of educating the child according to modern European principles. So, I mean, uh, during the 19th century, uh, you find uh, during the Victorian period that Bengali children's literature is starting to make its mark, let's say. Uh, and we have two very important people whose uh, very famous works are uh, the first known extremely popular works in Bengali children's literature. Uh, you have Modon Mohan Torkalongkar Shishu Shikha and you have Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar's Borno uh, Of course, Vidyasagar was uh, the premier intellectual of that time, let's say. Uh, and he is taking this responsibility of writing for children it itself, let me tell you, is a kind of revolutionary decision because he, as somebody who is extremely educated, uh, a Sanskrit pundit, uh, he is taking up this responsibility of uh, writing this new kind of children's literature. Uh, he himself wrote Bono Purichai and he also took up the responsibility to edit the later editions of Shishu Shikha. Uh, if you read Shishu Shikha and uh, especially Bono Purichai, what do you find? I mean, Bono Purichai is also like those early European works of children's literature, those early British works of children's literature, uh, works like John Newberry's Pocket Book, works like Hannah Moore and Sarah Moore's, uh, let's say, uh, they are cheap repository published books. Uh, it is also something like Goody Two Shoes. Bono Puricho is very didactic in nature. If you read Bono Puricho, uh, you find that uh, Bono Puricho does not really rely on narrative and such and such. Uh, it relies on instructions. Uh, you have exemplary pieces on uh, fictional uh, boys 
uh, and of course it is boys because Varna Purichoy uh, has almost no female characters. Uh, elderly female characters are there, like Bhuvan and Mashi is a very famous one. But uh, it's a strictly, let's say, male-dominated arena uh, because education itself was a male-dominated area back then in Bengal. Uh, so you have those boys who are uh, made to serve as exemplary figures. And what are they doing there? Uh, they are serving as medium of instruction. You have Gopal uh, and you have uh, somebody like Gopal who is a perfect good boy who obeys you, uh, who obeys the elders. Uh, and he's like uh, somebody, Jabar Kotha Shune, Kaharo Kotha Robad Dohana, Jahabai Tahai Kai, Jahabai Tahai Pore. He eats whatever is given to him, he dresses up. Uh, in whatever is given to him. He's so obedient and everybody should be like Gopal. The bottom line is something like Shabar Gopal er moto hawauji. And then you have the exemplary bad guy, uh, Rafal, uh, who listens to nobody. He gets beaten uh, in his educational institution. He is not loved by his parents. So Rafal oti kharap chile. Uh, nobody should be like him. And uh, in the second part of Bono Purichai, you have more complicated examples uh, and more, uh, let's say, threatening examples. Let's say there is a book uh, by Shivaji Bondobadhai, uh, Gopal Rakhal Dondo Shamash, uh, where he talks about uh, this syndrome of Bono Purichai, where Bono Purichai is, uh, it seems almost dry when we compare it to uh, later works of children's literature. I mean, the instructor is so much occupied with instructing the children here. Entertainment seems a uh, uh, strictly secondary priority here. Uh, his primary uh, intention is to educate the people. And he often uh, gets very angry in his story. Uh, places like, Jadob, tumi porite chona keno? Jao, porite basho, madhob. Shunilam Tumikal Mahababar Kotha Shononai Madhob, I heard that you disobeyed your parents. Do not do that uh, because uh, whoever does that is uh, termed as a bad boy. And then you have complicated examples like uh, you have uh, the lazy boy, you have uh, the boy who was good, uh, somebody like Nubin, the boy who was good but who had a habit of stealing, uh, so people hated him. Uh, and you, of course, have Bhubon. Uh, and Bhubon's example uh, is also something like, uh, let's say, uh, Mary Shelley is doing in Frankenstein. Bhubon's example is actually a kind of warning. I mean, what happens when the child does not have a good educator? Bhubon's responsibility uh, here, uh, I mean, Bhubon, of course, he turns out to be a very bad chap. He turns out to be a criminal. But the responsibility is not his, right? Uh, the main responsibility here, or lack of responsibility, let's say, lies with his mashi, uh, his aunt, because Ubon uh, one day brought a thing without telling anybody from school, and his mashi, instead of penalizing him, instead of uh, telling him not to do so, let's say, and explaining him why he should not do that, his mashi, his aunt, remains quiet. And as a result, uh, Bhubon goes on stealing and he becomes a hardened criminal after that. And everyone knows the story at the end when Bhubon gets apprehended by the police, the colonial power force, so to say, uh, he accosts his aunt and bites off her ear, saying that uh, you should have warned me long ago. You have failed in your responsibility as my guardian, as my educator. So that is kind of a warning at the end uh, of Bono Purisa, let's say. So what happens when you do not have an educator uh, for the children? And thank God you have an educator like the writer of Bono Purisa, who is instructing the children uh, in this text, so to say. So these are the early instances of uh, children's literature, Bono Purisa and Shishu Shikha. Uh, then you have somebody like Robindranath Thakur, who is uh, dabbling his hand in writing such kind of a book. Uh, it is termed Shohoj Part, where he, of course, is going two steps ahead. Because Shohoj Part is not, uh, it does not have that dry didactic tone, right? Shohoj Part is much more enjoyable. Uh, and Robindranath, uh, he creates those small, small narratives for people, uh, for uh, teaching them Juk Takkhor and Matra and so and so. 
because he realizes that uh, telling narratives will be uh, a much more enjoyable way to instruct the child instead of uh, giving just uh, didactic passages. And uh, also, uh, you find uh, Rabindranath, uh, he is also revolting, uh, kind of, against just putting more and more information and instruction. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, people like uh, Isha Chandra writing Borno Purichoy, maybe uh, he is revolting against such kind of uh, instruction, even. Uh, in a story called Tota Kahini, where he shows that uh, the Tota is actually a symbol for the young mind who actually dies, uh, literally uh, dies, let's say. Uh, the Tota becomes almost uh, uh, handicapped uh, out of uh, ex excess instruction, let's say, and less entertainment. Uh, so you have Robin Nona who was talking out uh, another way of instructing the child so his Shohol's part is a much more enjoyable read than Borno Purichai, let's say. And, uh, but again, what I'm trying to uh, say here that you should also keep in mind the basic similarity between the Lockean principles and this kind of an idea where the child needs to be instructed with care, with patience, because the child is an innocent one, right? Uh, the child has this tabula rasa, this blank mind, so he needs to be instructed. Uh, and he needs to be instructed gradually. So you have these primers becoming uh, more and more complicated as they go on. Bornopuricha Pratham Bhag is much easier than Bornopuricha Dityo Bhag. Sahajpat Pratham Bhag is much easier than Sahajpat Dityo Bhag. In Sahajpat second part, you have long narratives. And the last two narratives are pretty long. Uh, so and they are almost like, uh, let's say, uh, complete short stories, uh, the last two narratives of Shahoshpa. Uh, and then you have somebody like a revolutionary figure, somebody like Upendra Kishore Rai Chaudhuri, who is bringing out children's magazine. Uh, of course, uh, Victorian England had children's magazines, magazines like Boys' Own Paper. Uh, so Upendra Kishore is also bringing out uh, something like Sean Days, for instructing the people and also educating them and entertaining them. And he's also realizing the need for uh, good pictures, good illustrations, so to say. Uh, while reading, uh, while talking about Upendra Kishore, I will also uh, want you to keep in mind the fact that uh, these Bengali pioneers of children's literature, being people from uh, another country, let's say, they always had to go through this uh, period of cultural negotiation. Of course, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a much more extended way in the last session, my third session. Uh, but uh, you need to keep this in mind that uh, these people, they were uh, also realizing the need uh, to strike a balance between, let's say, traditional knowledge and this new kind of knowledge. So uh, when Upendra Kishore is bringing out Shondesh and he's writing for Shondesh, you will find that he strikes a fine balance between, let's say, European uh, knowledge and traditional knowledge. So you have him uh, writing uh, Chele De Ramayon, Chele De Mohabharo, uh, something like uh, those uh, traditional epics being explained, uh, being written in simple language. And uh, Puraner Golpo, uh, Mohabharata Kotha about the mythological stories of India. Uh, so these are like traditional knowledge, right? Uh, but again, you will have to keep in mind that what he is doing here is he is molding these traditional stories into a European mold. Because if you read Chele De Ramayana and Chele De Mohabharata, Ramayana and Mohabharata are actually circular tales, right? They do not have the linear directional narrative. Uh, like a European novel, let's say, uh, an 18th century novel. But if you read Chele De Raman and Chele De Mohabharat, you will find that Upendra Kishore has molded that uh, complicated roundabout narratives of these epics into a strictly unilinear narrative, let's say. Uh, they read like uh, Victorian novels uh, in simple language, uh, Chele De Raman and Chele De Mohabharat. So uh, the uh, let's say uh, the material may be traditional, but the treatment is uh, European, very much uh, British or European, if I may say so. 
and then you of course have upendra kishor shekale kotha where he is talking about uh, the various geological ages the various prehistorical creatures like mastodon like the mammoth like pterodactyl like the dinosaurs these are of course uh, i mean like uh, these are uh, very much uh, european knowledge he's talking about the findings of people like uh, charles edward lyell the geologist he's talking about fossils here uh, and upendra kishor is also talking about uh, other mythologies mythologies of other uh, communities let's say european communities he is writing on greek mythologies he is writing on uh, foreign mythologies uh, of course that was done on a much larger extent by his son sukumar roy and this is of course the early 20th century i'm talking about where he is writing about norse mythology he is writing about thor odin uh, loki freya uh, and he's also writing about uh, greek mythology he's writing about hercules uh, so these are traditional european knowledge but uh, you also find upendra kishore writing about uh, uh, these are uh, the, the new european knowledge is also getting balanced uh, for the children of bengal by traditional uh, stuff things like ramayana and mahabharata and uh, there is of course tom tunit boy which is very significant because tom tunit boy actually takes its uh, material from rural bengal uh, let's say from uh, the traditional folk tales where you have uh, animal characters speaking like human beings uh, folk tales like uh, i mean uh, the tradition is pretty old Uh, the tradition of katha shori chagor and jatoker kolpo and poncho tantro and then uh, the traditional village tales of uh, the truant fox uh, the and the stupid tiger and all uh, so those are actually the material the rural bengali material which is being fashioned by upendra kishore in modern bengali urban language for uh, the colonial bengali youth uh, the colonial bengali children let's say and then you have sukumar rai sukumar is uh, let's say a much uh, unique because he is what is he doing uh, he is actually uh, he can be compared to people like lewis carroll uh, he perhaps is the first one Uh, in bengali children's literature of course rubindranath uh, does that occasionally but sukumar as a routine he brings up uh, children characters who express their personality who assert their identity let's say mm. uh, i mean uh, sukumar even in his uh, children's uh, poems nonsense poems like uh, poems in abol tabol uh, what is he doing there he Uh, is very much revolting against uh, disciplinary institutions isn't he uh, he is satirizing them uh, in uh, poems like ikushayin uh, in poems like bomma gore raja he is actually making fun of the colonial authority uh, bomma gore raja is the king of england uh, bomma gore montri is the prime minister of england he is making fun of them he is satirizing their dominating personalities their urge to dominate people he is satirizing the babu uh, class the government officials in gofchuri uh, he is also making fun of them in gondhobicha where he is showing how the common people are afraid of the colonial authority so there is always this uh, this tone of uh, disobeying authority in shukumar's writings even when he is not showing children in his uh, children's literature he is questioning authority and when he actually brings up children uh, we'll see that he actually brings up bad boys he does not bring up innocent boys because who is sukumar's child hero uh, a character like pagla dashu uh, and uh, sukumar's uh, short stories uh, in the collection pagla dashu uh, they are actually inspired from uh, the victorian school stories right i mean victorian school stories like tom brown school days by thomas hughes uh, of course tom brown school days Uh, had its own imitating uh, counterparts during the early part of bengali children's literature let's say there was a book called dukho joyir joy jatra where uh, it is also a description of how a boy like tom brown he enters the educational institution uh, excels uh, earns several accolades and becomes a success in life i will talk about dukho joyir joy jatra in much uh, more extended scope in the next lecture but what is shukumar actually doing 
Shukumar's Pagla Dasu does not have these good boys as the heroes, let's say. Uh, the central character is somebody like Pagla Dasu, who does not obey any kind of discipline. Uh, he disobeys people. He always challenges the authority. And he realizes that authority and power will always try to control you. And he mocks authority. Uh, I mean, there is, uh, there is a stage in the first story, Pagla Dasu, where uh, Pagla Dasu uh, comes to school wearing a half pant. And people, uh, his... Uh, classmates ask him, uh, why have you worn a half pant? And Pagla Dasu says, uh, because I want to learn English language. Uh, so uh, Pagla Dasu has actually realized that English language uh, in the colony is a marker of class. Uh, English language does not only mean the language, it also means a certain kind of dress, a dress code, a certain kind of etiquette, let's say, a certain kind of social prestige. So that is how he's actually mocking the rulers, right? He's actually mocking power. And we find that a character like Pagla Dasu, uh, he is inside a disciplinary institution. All the stories in Pagla Dasu are written in school. Let's say they are about school. But uh, they do not actually... Uh, Pagla Dasu never really gets, uh, let's say, uh, dominated by the institution. He's always creating problems. Uh, he does not obey people. Uh, he puts crackers under uh, the teacher's chair in the story Chine Potka. He insults the good boys, so to say, people like Roma Paddo, uh, who are uh, much like Gopal, who always obey people. Uh, and sometimes the innocent people are not so innocent after all, because Roma Paddo uh, is actually a, a very cunning fellow. Uh, and there are other characters, whose uh, other students, who are not so innocent as well, people like uh, the Chaliyat. Uh, their uh, pretensions are getting challenged here. So you finally have a writer uh, in Shukumar Rai who is actually uh, challenging the authority, uh, let's say, who is uh, showing boys uh, who uh, do not get dominated by the adults and who do not get dominated by the structure, by the, inst by the institution, uh, let's say. Uh, and they actually assert their uh, identity. Uh, so, uh, and of course, this thing will be done uh, in uh, a more wider scope by uh, Shukumar Rai's uh, followers, let's say, uh, people who actually belong to his own family, uh, and they will write, uh, they will continue writing for uh, the children of Bengal uh, later, people like Leela Mojundar and Shotojit Rai, where we will see uh, that uh, Leela Mojundar and Shotojit Rai also, when they write about uh, children, let's say, uh, they do not write about good boys. They do not write about figures who get dominated by the adults. Uh, we'll talk about them, of course, uh, in the next lecture. And uh, what we will also do is we will see how uh, Indian uh, children's literature, or let's say Bengali children's literature, it even when it is getting influenced by the European model, it is maintaining some kind of a distinction. Uh, it is uh, creating some kind of a conscious difference. Uh, so uh, that is something which I will uh, talk about uh, in the last session, uh, because that is uh, also a very important kind of negotiation, right? I mean, differentiating yourself from the ruler's discourse. Uh, so, so much for the second session. Uh, have a very good day, people. Thank you.